going to be talking briefly about um, iliopsoas issues. You know, you can see uh, from this one image here, and I've got a bunch more images, that uh, as we all know, the iliopsoas comes over the anterior superior aspect of the hip and really is right there. As, as those of you that uh, perform uh, iliopsoas releases, actually, uh, Mark asked you guys a question. That's a good idea. How many uh, of you guys have experienced releasing iliopsoas tendons? Okay. So um, there are a couple indications for uh, working with the iliopsoas. Uh, a lot of the times it can be treated non-operatively, um, but sometimes you do need to, uh, to work with it operatively. Uh, but as you can see here in this image, there are definitely cases where the iliopsoas comes right over the uh, anterior superior labrum. And in addition to the femoral tabular um, impingement, you can, uh, you can get some uh, labral issues as a result of that, in addition to the other symptoms that patients can get. So the iliopsoas, obviously, a uh, combination uh, tendon of the, where the psoas and the iliacus uh, meet together, coming right over the anterior aspect of the hip and inserting on the um, lesser troch. So the pathology uh, is generally you can have a couple different forms. You can have like a bursitis in the area, um, either a muscle tendinous impingement or snap. I know all of us have probably encountered that patient with either the external or the internal snapping hip. Obviously, the iliopsoas is the source of the internal snapping hip. Uh, and then you can get muscle ten tears as well. Uh, this image uh, is a pretty good one that kind of shows how in the cases of a tight iliopsoas tendon, when you have a patient going from a flexed leg to extended leg, I actually saw one just, uh, just this past week, where uh, they get a, basically a recurrent pop as they're going from a flexion to extended position, they'll get a popping as that iliopsoas goes from the lateral aspect of the femoral head, popping immediately over the medial aspect of the femoral head. And there are generally three predisposing factors that people can get to iliopsoas uh, um, snapping and popping and pain. Uh, one would be increased femoral antiversion. You know, here you can see a, a CT showing the uh, femoral antiversion um, of a shot through the knee in comparison to the hip. Uh, and then uh, down below that, you can see two images, um, the A image being the one on the left, showing the normal uh, um, femoral antiversion of about 14 degrees, and the one on the right showing that if you had a CT of those at the knee and then at the hip, showing the increased femoral antiversion. Another predisposing factor uh, could be, would be trauma. Uh, you know, in this case, uh, this patient had a hip dislocation, uh, and that uh, you can see how that trauma could lead to iliopsoas pathology in addition to a lot of other pathology in that hip. Uh, and then one of the most common course, sources of uh, iliopsoas pain is actually total hip arthroplasty. If the cup is prominent anteriorly uh, or uh, superiorly, as you can see here, a lot of very prominent uh, uh, acetabular cup there, you can uh, get impingement of the iliopsoas over that. Uh, and there have been many cases where uh, patients have done a lot better and relieved their symptoms when the iliopsoas has been uh, lengthened uh, after uh, this type of impingement. There are other sources of iliopsoas impingement as well, but we won't get into all of those. Um, so physical exam findings, the two tests that I tend to use uh, most regularly are is the resisted straight leg raise uh, and the flexion abduction external rotation, basically circumduction. Uh, basically with the flexion, with the resistant straight leg raise, patients will usually uh, say that they have pain as well as some weakness on that side in terms of uh, the resistant straight leg. Uh, and then the flexion, abduction, external rotation, where you're going from a flexed, abducted, externally rotated position, basically circumducting the leg back down to a full extended position, you can frequently get that internal snapping. And I'll just basically place my hand right over the groin to confirm that the snapping is really internal as opposed to external, and you'll feel the osoas popping right over the anterior aspect of the femoral head there. Uh, another way of uh, confirming it, you can use dynamic ultrasound. It's a very good way of, uh, if you have a, 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 some, if you've either versed in ultras, uh, ultrasound technique yourself, or you have a tech that's very good at it, you can actually see the iliopsoas tendon snapping around. Uh, and sometimes people will use uh, a local injection, ultrasound guided into that area to see if it re temporarily relieves the symptoms, uh, and then you have a diagnosis. So a lot of the uh, iliopsoas tightness can be treated non-operatively with stretching and proper techniques, but occasionally you'll get, to the, get the patient that does need to have a release. Um, there are, generally speaking, three levels of release that are described. You've got the transcapsular or label release uh, that's frequently done in the younger patients, and when, uh, with, during hip arthroscopy, it's, 
It's an easy adjunct to add to, uh, to the procedure if, the patient, if it's indicated in the patient. Uh, you can release at the level of the femoral neck and then also at the lesser troche. So there was a patient, uh, a study published by uh, Bloomberg and AGSM in 2011 talking about the cross-sectional analysis of the iliopsoas muscle tendon unit uh, at the different sites of uh, arthroscopic releases. Um, basically, obviously, if you have your young athlete and you're doing an iliopsoas release, at first you may have a lot of fear that this patient's going to have some significant hip flexion weakness. Um, but what they found in their study, what's been you know, found in numerous studies, is that uh, the iliopsoas is one of those muscles that's rare in the fact that it's got muscle fibers running all the way from its origin to its, its insertion. Unlike the semitendinosus and you know, the, the muscles we tend to harvest with uh, knee surgery, they don't have a purely tendinous uh, aspect of the uh, muscle uh, tendon unit. At the level of the labrum, about 30% of the total volume of the musculotendinous uh, unit is tendon, with uh, the remainder 60% being muscle fibers. At the transcapsular release area, basically, which is the, I think this, in this case they're referring to the um, the femoral neck releases, it's about 50%. And then even if you release it at the lesser troke, you know, thinking of our knowledge of other tendons, you think that at the lesser troke would be purely tendinous, but it's still only 60% tendon and 40% muscle. So if you're doing releases and you're releasing the tendon, you still are basically, you're doing a lengthening. You're not doing a complete release uh, as we would talk about in other, uh, other areas of the body. So, here is a, basically a, a view of the hip. Uh, we've got the femoral head, of course, to the left, the acetabulum to the right. And we're basically looking at about, um, if this is a uh, right hip, it'd be about the 3 o'clock. So this is, a, um, uh, this is a left hip. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and so it's about basically 9 o'clock, um, right where you see the, uh, basically the iliopsoas uh, notch. So just like in the shoulder, at about the 3 o'clock position, you've got kind of a notch there. Uh, and that's right where the iliopsoas is. So basically, the iliopsoas, when you're looking arthroscopically, essentially appears as it's, if it's coming out of that iliopsoas notch and heading right towards the femoral head. Uh, so the first thing I'll do is basically start extending my capsulotomy more anteriorly using a uh, wand here. Uh, and then basically, as you're extending more anteriorly, you just come across the fibers of the iliopsoas. Here's the first image of an upcoming video. Once again, just it's kind of the similar image that we saw before. Femoral head is to the left, the acetabulum to the right, the labrum. This is the anterior superior labrum here. And you can see at the very bottom of the image kind of that little notch, the iliopsoas notch there. So with the video, we've got the uh, wand and basically just kind of showing orientation that that's essentially where the, uh, the iliopsoas tendon is, right there at about the 2, 3 o'clock area. Uh, and as I've extended my capsulotomy anteriorly, you just come right across it. So here I am just releasing the tendon. And then as I get close to being finished releasing the tendon and get through the tendon fibers, you can see the muscle fibers and how they respond to the, uh, the wand, kind of pulling away from the wand. And even if I took a little bit of the muscle, at this point it's only 40% tendon, 60% muscle. So you're not doing a complete release. You're basically just doing a lengthening of the tendon right there. Occasionally, the iliopsoas can basically have, um, uh, be bifurcated uh, down in that area. So sometimes you'd want to be careful if you're going to do a complete release to go a little bit lower. Here, I've gone a little bit lower, and I've switched to a reverse cutting uh, blade just because that's another way that people will do releases. And in my experience, what I've found is if you're using a, a, a reverse cutting blade or something like that, it tends to really more gum up the area. As you can see, this release is nowhere clear as clean and as uh, easily visualized as with the wand. So I tend to prefer to do it with the wand because it just creates a, a much more easy visualization. You can kind of see what you're doing. Here's a video uh, of uh, Dr. Maidan also doing a iliopsoas release. So uh, he's got his wand in and he's basically identified where the iliopsoas is and very carefully going through the capsule. So you can see the iliopsoas right there through the capsule. You can basically almost see, in this case, you can almost see the iliopsoas transparently through that capsule. Uh, and once he's got the uh, iliopsoas identified, he'll just care carefully release it with the, uh, uh, with the wand, going through the tendinous part, but uh, leaving the muscular part intact.
So he's just carefully releasing the tendon. And then once it's, uh, once it's fully released, you'll frequently see the tendon kind of uh, pop open there, kind of like you saw there. But leaving the muscle fibers and uh, obviously still leaving the uh, musculotendinous unit uh, intact from uh, origin to insertion. Okay, so uh, any questions about the iliopsoas before we move on to the uh, uh, dysplasia? Excellent point. Yeah, so... Uh, frequently, the iliopsoas, when released, will be done at the very end of the case. Uh, so the question was, are you, are you worried about um, basically pump pressure and extravasation of the fluid when you do these releases? And there definitely have been case reports where the fluid can kind of track up the iliopsoas into the abdomen. Um, so I think if it's done at the end of the case, it's generally speaking not too much of a problem. Uh, if you're doing it at the very beginning of the case and you'd be in there for a couple hours, then it'd be something that you'd want to uh, definitely keep in mind. Uh, I mean, I've heard of cases there where the, uh, you'll have a, basically the nurse kind of checking things to make sure you're not getting a, a big, almost pregnant-looking belly that I've actually heard about with endoscopic proximal hamstring repairs as well. But it's done, best to be done at the end of the case, kind of right before you're finished, for that exact reason, so you don't have fluid extravasation into the abdomen. Uh, so the question is, if you have uh, increased femoral antiversion, do you still do the tendon release? Um, you're talking about, you're worried about uh, instability as a result. You know, there are a lot of uh, go-betweens between the biceps and the shoulder and the iliopsoas and the hip. Just the same way that you have your biceps killers in the shoulder, that they always take down the biceps. You have some surgeons um, that take down the iliopsoas in all cases. I don't particularly believe the biceps does that much to add stability in the shoulder, and I'm not really sure the iliopsoas is doing a ton, plus we're not releasing the entire thing. Um, in cases of increased femoral antiversion, you'll have even more symptoms with the iliopsoas. So it really depends on patient symptoms. Um, while I might be nervous about a large capsulotomy that's left open in the dysplastic patient or a patient that's a little bit unstable, personally I'm not that uh, worried about the iliopsoas release, because it's, it's really just a lengthening of the tendon. It's not a lengthening of the musculotendinous unit. It's not really a complete cutting of the whole structure.